Now, the writer of that song wrote that song. Mr. Weigel wrote that song because his family was being ripped apart. Ripped apart, honestly, ripped apart. And he made up his mind to serve the Lord, but uh, not everybody in his family had, had that idea. Out of his despair, he wrote that. I'm sure in his heart he'd be happy to know a beautiful family like this is singing it because their hearts are united for the Lord. Oh, that's interesting, isn't it? And all of it, how God works in all of it. Thank you. That was beautiful. Beautifully given. Thank you for, for allowing the Lord to use you. Luke chapter 2, if you'll go there with me. Uh, this morning, I keep wanting to find my way back to the book of Colossians. Our church has been studying there for some time, but I think I've come in the Christmas account, I've come to my what I call my favorite portion of it. Here as we come to the end of Luke chapter 2. Now this, the account is not finished in Bethlehem with the birth of Christ. There's so much that is revealed about the Lord as we continue to read this very special chapter in God's Word. Something that we need to know about, about our Lord Jesus Christ. And God uses two of his choice servants to make these revelations. And I want to study, I believe this morning we may have only the time for Simeon. And we'll see, God allows us to deal with Anna. Uh, but these are special servants of God. If you'll go with me there in Luke chapter 2 and verse 20, it says, And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as was told unto them. It's almost like there's a, whew, there's a pause. This has been amazing. <laughs> We're going back. And look here in verse 21 now. When the eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace and court according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul, own soul as also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And we'll stop our reading there this morning here. And this is a wonderful account in God's word given of Simeon and also of Anna, which I hope to deal with very soon. But the primary phrase that we see here as he sees the Lord Jesus Christ enter the temple in the arms of mother and dad, he looks at a young child who's probably about 40 days old and recognizes immediately this baby was unlike any other baby. He knows this is the Messiah. The Holy Ghost revealed it unto him. It's amazing what God will do in our life when we yield to him. But he had been waiting a long time. He was not a young whippersnapper anymore. He'd been waiting a long time. Anna, by the way, had been waiting a long time for God to fulfill his promise, to come to make good on the promise of Genesis 3.15, to make good on the promise of Isaiah chapter 7 and Isaiah chapter 9 and Micah chapter, uh, chapter 5. And now we see the Lord Jesus Christ stepping forward here. Christmas, no doubt, is associated with waiting. As a child, we felt like we would wait and wait and wait for Christmas to come. It's never going to get here. Amen. And now, as an adult, I feel like it comes around more quickly than my bank account is prepared for. How about you? Yeah, I'm not able to recover from one Christmas before the next one is here. And we know, we know around here in our church, in our house, it's a little bit different because we celebrate the Lord's birthday on December the 25th. We celebrate my wife Jennifer's birthday on the 26th of December. And by the way, thank you to all those that gathered for her surprise party yesterday. Uh, we didn't shock her too badly, but she was pretty shocked. Uh, she uh, let me know on the way home if I'd have been a little more forthright. She'd been a little better prepared for that. Anyway, her birthday is on the 26th. And uh, then on Monday, we have Nathaniel's birthday on the 30th. 
So we have, it's a season of birthdays for us and all that's going on. But we wait and wait and wait for Christmas. Children often wait to receive some gift maybe they've been dreaming of and hoping to receive. I can still remember, I can remember several Christmases as a young boy. I remember when I got my red, white, and blue guitar. I said, we have a picture of it somewhere, a Polaroid picture of it somewhere in a family album at home. And um, I could tell you some history behind all that, but it's not very spiritual, so we won't go into it very long. But if anybody ever knew who Buck Owens was, you'd understand why I wanted that guitar. You'd understand why I wanted it. That's why I wanted it, and I, I got it. I can remember another Christmas several years later, and, you know, as, as I think when I was about nine or ten years old, and we were moving along, we were waiting. I, re- I don't remember wanting anything in particular, but I'm always thinking it's going to be Christmas. It's going to be very good. And uh, we got in the room there. We are in Greer, South Carolina. We had moved into another house, not the house that I trusted Christ in, but we had moved into another house now. I can remember that house very vividly. It was a nice new place. We didn't live there very long before the Lord moved us to Virginia. But we lived there for a while. I remember waking up on Christmas morning. We'd go in to get some gifts. And uh, my sister got under the tree and opened up this wonderful little our miniature arcade game. It looked like, you know, if you remember the old arcades you'd walk into, the big, the big games you would play. And it was, a, it was a small Miss Pac-Man arcade game there. It was amazing. As a 9 or 10-year-old boy, I thought, this is great. Who knows what I'm going to get? I mean, that's my sister. I'm probably going to get something even better than that, probably. So we opened up my gift, and my dear parents, who I love with all my heart, gave me a winter jacket. For Christmas a winter coat as you could imagine I did not receive that gift very well I did not receive it very well that day I was not a grateful child very far from it spoiled ungrateful the coolest thing about that jacket was you could unzip the sleeves off of it and make a little vest out of it I remember it it was t- brown and tan I remember it very well I was not grateful I waited a long time and it wasn't quite what I expected It wasn't quite what I expected. Simeon had been waiting a long time in the temple, and Jesus was more than he could have ever dreamed. More than he could have ever dreamed. In our text, Jesus, the Lamb of God, has been born. God has stepped out of eternity. He's entered entered into human history. Jesus, as the Lamb, had been promised. Jesus, as the Lamb, had been prepared. Now he is being provided. And our text takes us now in Jerusalem uh, for an event that takes place now 40 days after Christ's birth. We see some information that's given to us here as we get into verse number 21. It says, and when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus. There were some ceremonies that were taking place here with me. If you'll go uh, to Leviticus chapter 12 for just a moment, help us understand and get the, get the idea of what God is doing. I want you to know that even as in the first few days of Jesus' life, Mary and Joseph were doing everything they could to abide by the law that God had given now, we have an idea that they were doing what they knew to do to raise this child the way God wanted him to be raised. Say, so they better do that. He's Jesus Christ. Well, yes, but I think all parents realize that opportunity and responsibility. What a precious thing we have. But in Leviticus chapter 12, it says here, referring to the Old Testament law and what takes place with the birth of a child, in verse 1 it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, says, Speak unto, thy, unto the children of Israel, saying, If a woman have conceived seed and born a man-child, then she shall be unclean seven days, according to the days of the separation. For her infirmity shall she be unclean. And the eighth day the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. And she, and she shall then continue in the blood of her purifying three and thirty days. She shall touch no hallowed thing, nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purifying be fulfilled. But if she bear a maid a child, if she bear a, a girl, then she shall be unclean two weeks as, her separation, as in her separation. And she shall continue in the blood of her purifying three score and six days. And when the days of her purifying are fulfilled for a son... Or for a daughter, she shall bring a lamb of the first year for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, who shall offer it before the Lord and make an atonement for her, and she shall be cleansed from the issue of her blood. This is the law for her that hath born a male or a female. And if she uh, be not able to bring a lamb, then she shall bring two turtle doves, two, excuse me, two turtles or two young pigeons, and the one for a burnt offering, and the other for a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for her, and she shall be clean. What's happening here in Luke chapter 2 is Joseph and Mary abiding by the Old Testament law as they ought to as believers in God, bringing Jesus Christ here into the temple. And we see what God is doing at eight eight days old, the circumcision, the ceremony of circumcision, which identified 
that, which identified Jesus Christ with the Jewish people, and they identified themselves with God who keeps his promises the covenant that God had there. After 40 days, Mary reached the end of this time of purification. There's a ceremony there that we just read about in Leviticus chapter 12. And so we see this ceremony taking place. And now Jesus is 40 days old and they enter in for the ceremony of presenting him to the Lord. Presenting him to the Lord. Interesting that we're presenting the Messiah back to God the Father in a sense. They were doing exactly what they knew to do. And on this occasion, Simeon and Anna, who we will speak of, God willing, sometime soon, Simeon and Anna appear. They attest to the fact that this is not like any other baby. They announce to all those within earshot that this is the Messiah and he's to be worshipped. They're overwhelmed. And while the intent for Mary and Joseph was to come in and to abide by the requirements of the law, the purpose of this passage and what God was doing is to let us know that the babe born in Bethlehem absolutely is the Lord Jesus Christ, the promised one, the Messiah, and he had a mission to accomplish and to fulfill. They are high, they are, these folks here are highlighted because of their godliness, because of their commitment. They're people that we ought to emulate and, and people, God willing, that we can live like in the time that God gives us. God gave them much time on this earth. Simeon and Anna, much time. If they were part of our congregation today, no doubt they would, they would be the eldest members we would have at Calvary Baptist Church. They stayed faithful all the way through. And God gave them maybe their greatest day on this day. And they lived many years to see this day. Uh, my friend, can I say before we even get started well this morning, don't stop. You haven't seen your best day yet. You haven't seen your best day yet. I, I refer to this often as I think about my own life and I think about what we're doing in this church. You haven't seen your best day yet. Your best day is not going to be lived at the height of your physical prowess. Your best day will not be lived when you have the largest amount of money available in your own bank account. Your best day will be lived when you lay your eyes on the precious Lord Jesus Christ. That'll be the best day you will live. You may live that day in a physical, a weakened physical state. You may live that day uh, without, without even much recognition of what's going on around you, but I want you to know the day you see Jesus will be the best day that you will live on this earth. There's no doubt about it. And we may we live every day in the light of that day. Simeon and Anna are highlighted here in this passage because of their faithfulness to God. We must take note as we think about Joseph and Mary coming in the, the scripture tells us in Leviticus chapter 12 that they could come in and bring a, a first-year lamb. That's what you could do if you had the funds to do it. That's what you could do if you had the resources to provide it. But if not, you bring in the offering of a poor, a poor family. The turtle doves and the pigeons that could be offered in place of the lamb were a sign that Jesus truly was born in the humblest of ways and to the humblest of people. And the king of the universe did not step into human history and take a man-made throne, but he was born in a manger in the humblest of ways and took on flesh, though he was in the form of God, to fulfill the mission of God and to pay our redemption on the cross. Thank God for it. Another indicator here that Christ didn't come to this world for anything this world could give him. He came for us. He came for us. Simeon and Anna, these faithful folks, attest to the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, this 40-day-year-old infant. They saw something different. And why would God reveal it to these folks? Why would Simeon, as we think about him, first of all, in this hour, why would God reveal it to him? Let's take a look at his life and understand who God wants to work with according to what God tells us here in this passage, who God wants to work with. I want to say this first of all, the best of my knowledge or my limited understanding of who God is and what he says in his word, God wants to work with all people. Let me repeat myself again. Christ, when he went to the cross, my friends, he tasted death for every single person that's ever lived or ever will live. He became sin for us, he who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So there's no sinner outside of the grace of God. There's no sin, yea, except the sin of unbelief that can keep someone from, from saving grace. Yes, there's no sin except the sin of unbelief that will keep someone from the eternal salvation that we find in the Lord. Christ can save what we call the worst of sinners. He surely can do that. I'm glad to report that he saved me. And I hope you have that same testimony today. By the way, I, I, I took that salvation. That salvation was offered to me, and it became mine because I received it. And if you have not yet received it, it doesn't belong to you. There's a gift wrapped up in a beautiful bow. It's sitting right under the tree. 
with your name on it, have you received it in the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ? You must take it. You must receive it. You must repent. You must ask Jesus into your heart. Don't let the gift stay under the tree. What kind of man can God work with? I think he wants to work with everyone. But what kind of man is Simeon that he could work with here in this passage? We understand more about his life. If you look with me in verse 25, you'll go there in God's word of Luke chapter 2. It says, Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem. His name was Simeon. By the way, the meaning of his name is one who hears and obeys. I, I, I've said to our church even recently, I like names that have meaning. If you remember that message. And my wife and I went round and round about the names of our children. And uh, as usual, she won. She won about that. But uh, I love all my children. I love their names. She just had to convince me a little bit about those things. But Simeon is one who hears and obeys. And really all we know of Simeon is what Luke tells us here. It says here in verse 25, and Simeon, again, one who hears and obeys. That's the meaning of his name. God help us. The same man was just and devout. By the way, we only become just. What does that mean, just? That means you're without stain, without error, without sin. The only way you become just is by taking the righteousness that's given from Jesus Christ. That's it. And God, that's, that's no doubt about it. In fact, we're given a clue to that in 1 John 1, 9. When we talk about to, to believers, we're talking about believers there in 1 John. When we say we can confess our sin, we have daily sin. If you've been saved yet you still have trouble with sin, would you say amen? amen. I'm glad to hear I'm, I'm, in, I'm in a company of sinners. Your pastor is a sinner. I need God's grace. I've accepted Christ. I have eternal salvation. I struggle with sin day by day in this flesh. One day I'll be delivered from it. The presence and the power of it, I'll be delivered from it. Those are our friends and loved ones that are with the Lord are delivered from it. As we think about sin, if we confess our sins, even as believers, the Bible says it's about God. He is faithful and just. I mean, he has every right. He has all the power. He has the status. Simeon, it says here, was just. He was just, he was a just man. He did not have his own righteousness, he, but he was devout. The righteousness and the justness that he has, the, 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 free, the freedom from guilt that he has, that just situation that he existed in, existed because he believed in God, he looked for the Messiah, and he was a man who was committed to the cause of God. He was clean, no doubt. He was just, he was righteous before God, but he was a man that was committed. I want you to know, if you want God to work with you, you want God to touch your life? You have to realize you're going to have to be committed to the Lord to see God's greatest blessing. I'm going to have to be committed to God to see God's greatest blessing. God did an amazing work in this man's life. In the latter years of his life, you and I, you and I walk around occasionally, excuse me, I don't, I, don't want to, I don't know what to say, I don't know all of you, but occasionally I'll walk around thinking God owes me something or God ought to work through me or God, God can do, God's going to do this, this, and this with me. But I ought to be very committed to God to have any idea that he would want to touch and bless and use my life. Committed to him. That's who he is. The man is just. He's devout. How do we know that he's just and devout? Well, it says here he's waiting for the consolation of Israel, waiting for comfort. The Jewish people lived under the, dom the domination of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire, uh, another one in the line of empires that really took charge in the world and really prepared the way for the coming of Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. But in his lifetime, the Romans had been in power. Though there was some benevolence in some ways, they absolutely detested monotheism. <laughs> they were not, they were not allow, they, they would allow you to bring your religion into the fold, but they all expected you to adhere to other religions as well. They did, not, they did not accommodate. He realized there was something better than the Roman Empire. By the way, uh, Simeon was not looking for some political revolution. Listen, I, 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 have, I think we ought to make our voice known, and I tell our people at Calvary Baptist Church, you ought to vote. In fact, in the last election, I said, if you don't vote on Tuesday, don't come back to church on Wednesday because you're going to hear about it. You're going to hear about it. Be involved. I'm not telling you who to vote for, but uh, we all have something to say about it after it's over. We ought to be involved. We have the privilege. But he wasn't looking for a political revolution. Our hope is not in Washington, D.C. or in Richmond. Uh, our hope is not there. We ought to pray for our leaders. We ought to make our, our, make our thoughts known and our biblical objectives known, no doubt about that. We ought to do it with the love of Jesus Christ and stand firm. This man was not looking for a political revolution as he waited for the consolation of Israel. Some of the disciples were ready for Jesus to have a political revolution. They were looking to knock Herod out of the way, not Pilate out of the way. They were looking to be on the right hand and on the left hand. They were looking to wield the sword, but the sword is not the means of God's work. 
is the work of the Holy Spirit. He's waiting for the consolation of Israel. What is he waiting for? This comforting thought and expecting the promises of God. He had his heart set on the messianic promises of God. And I remind our church again, I speak of it often, but this is a 4,000-year-old promise. As he looked across the cemeteries, they, they maybe had an exposure to, there are people that, that lie in those cemeteries that thought the Messiah would come in their lifetime, yet he had not come. They, 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 he, he looked, he maybe he looked through a family picture album if he would have had something available and think about those he knew that loved and served God or maybe look back at a family Bible with generation of generation of generation and generation of people that had said yes to God and waited and thought God was going to do this in their lifetime. It had not happened yet, but that did not stop him from believing that God was going to make good on his promise. You know, in our life, we struggle and we wait and we think, dear God, when are you going to help me? You know, I, if I could say it, speak from my heart for a moment, if you forgive me, but I, there have been days when I've stood at this cemetery right down here next to my mom and dad's grave, and it come, it's just hit me like a ton of bricks. Maybe it should have hit me much sooner. There have been a lot of brokenhearted sons standing beside their mom and daddy's grave saying, Jesus, why don't you just come today and fix it now? I'm not the only one. I feel like the only one that's ever happened to. How, how foolish. It's foolish to stand there and think this is worse than it's ever been. Well, it feels worse because it's happening to me. But I look, just look at across St. Luke's, that beautiful cemetery park there, and then I think about all my friends that are there who are waiting. They're sleeping, waiting for Jesus. And I, I, it's sometimes I say to myself, dear God, I, I, I'm praying you'll, you'll take care of this in my lifetime. But, you know, I may live to be 70, 80 years old, I don't know if I'm on a track to make it that far or not, but if I may live to be 70 or 80 years old, and I may not see God, Jesus, come back in this lifetime, I may not see it, but I sure am not going to quit praying for it and keep believing that he... I'm going to keep believing he's coming because he said he would. Simeon said he's waiting for the consolation. This is not a young man. Excuse me. This is an older man. And... uh. He allowed, excuse me, how do I say it? He allowed God to keep his tank full. His, his tank is of expectancy and belief. And again, that doesn't happen by accident. You've got to do something. If you want your faith to stay strong, you've got to do something. If you're going to sit back, kick your feet up on the recliner and wait for God to come in, he's not, excuse me, he's not going to show up. Now, God's loving and gracious and benevolent. Excuse me for talking so boldly and frankly to you. Many of you are visiting today. I'm trying to be as nice as I can. I, I'm working on it. But it, you know, after all he's done for me, the little chorus says, how can I do less than give him my best after all he's done for me? And if I want God to work, now God's grace is bigger than my desires and bigger than what I want, but I want you to know that we ought to be willing to walk toward the Lord, step toward him so he can do what he wants to do. This is what Simeon does. Hey, decade after decade of other people going to the grave of the promise not yet delivered, yet he still waited for the consolation of Israel. I want you to know God's promises are still good. And I want you to keep waiting. I want to keep waiting. Let's, let's get our eyes off ourselves and get it on God. Sometimes I just have to take a broader swath in my view of history as I stand out there and realize this is not about me. It's not about me getting what I want today. It's not about my heart just being mended right now. But God will make it good in the best time, in the right time, just like he did when Jesus appeared in human history in Bethlehem. It was the right time. It was the right place. It was the right circumstance. And looking at it now, 2,000 years later, we say, hey, that was all amazing. God must know what he's doing. Well, duh, he's God. Sure, he knows what he's doing. But it does change when your heart is full and your heart's breaking, doesn't it? Don't quit waiting. Don't quit looking. As I spoke to Doug in the hospital the other day, Doug Allen, I came in just after he'd gotten very devastating news. He knew something was wrong, but it, I, almost, I almost came in unaware. I, I, I didn't know it was quite to this level. As we talked together and prayed together, I, I didn't even know what to say, quite honestly. But I said, I know you've made a decision about your treatment. And it's through, I believe you've made the right decision. By the way, he's not just thinking about himself. He's thinking about his precious wife. 
all of his family, all the things. I said, but please, I said, I don't know how to say it to you. I said, but please, I, I know you've made a decision here, but don't lose your hope in what God, who, what God is doing and what God can do. Amen. Even in the face of death, we can still wait for the consolation because God keeps his promise. And God gives us the faith to believe those words. God give me the faith to believe those words. I'm amazed at Simeon. You say, what kind of man does God work with? I don't know if I can live up to half of this. But look at the man. He's just. I mean, he's, he's clean. Nobody can put a point a finger at him. He's, he's devout. He's committed. He's doing something for God. He's waiting for the consolation of Israel, still believing the promises, still looking. I don't know. Maybe other babies had walked through the temple and it caught his eye and he thought, maybe. maybe. It's like, well, no. I, I don't know in my sanctified, hopefully sanctified imagination. Maybe he did those things. I don't know if he did or not, but this much I do know. In verse 25, it says, this is, these are a, this is a mouthful here in just one little verse. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. You know why he knew the baby was Jesus? Because he had the Holy Ghost. And thank God for the comforter of the Holy Ghost. Jesus said, I'm leaving here. And one of the reasons I'm leaving is so we can send the comforter. Jesus had come as, God, as the God of the universe, the creator of the world, but he limited himself to a human body. He still was working miracles, but he was not everywhere all the time in that human body. But in the person of the Holy Spirit, we all have help. In the person of the Holy Spirit, there is no limitation to that ministry. And by the way, I received the Holy Spirit on that day. I trusted Christ as my Savior. That's when you receive the Holy Spirit. Now, I believe that the Holy Spirit will fill us, but we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, when we come to Christ. Thank God for that. In the moment of our salvation. And we thank God for that. I'm glad to report, though, since the age of 10, when I trusted Christ, the Holy Spirit came to live inside of me. I'm glad to report there have been many days when God was able, His Holy Spirit filled me and allowed me to serve Him and do His work and just to know His presence. But this man knew it was Jesus. He saw what God was doing because the Holy Ghost was upon him. I believe he didn't just have him living inside of him. I believe he was filling him because he was a yielded servant, completely yielded to him. And he saw things and understood things that normal people don't. Other people don't even want to see or don't have on their radar screen. And God help us to have that kind of vision of what God wants. The Holy Ghost was upon him. I mean, he consciously was living in the presence of God. And, you know, they're really for a true believer, someone that really knows God, and God helped me to live this way. There, is no, there isn't a secular life and a sacred life. In fact, the Bible says it this way. My life is Christ. That's my life. And everything grows out of that. So some of us will leave here today and we'll check church off the box and we're done with it till the next time we decide to come back. But that's not the life that God intended. And I'm not just talking about people visiting today. I'm talking about people that regularly attend this church. They've got church on their list every week, and we check it off, and we're done with God. But God, that's not what God's looking for. Jesus, remember, God came there in the garden in the cool day. He seeks fellowship with us. When sin broke the fellowship, Jesus stepped in to bring us back together, and God wants us to be near and with him. And he's, he's, he wants that. Listen, this man lived consciously in the presence of the Holy Ghost. Imagine God was coming down in the garden, and now God in this New Testament age lives on the inside of us. What opportunity do we have for relationship? It goes on to say in verse 26 here, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost. Again, that's what the Holy Ghost does. Shows us things we don't know, things we can't figure out, leads us when we don't know what step to take. Do you need any of that in your life? Let me answer the question for you. Excuse me. Yes, you do. Does Pastor Greg need it? Absolutely. Absolutely. The Holy Ghost will lead us. It was revealed on him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And that was his specific promise. That's a big promise. That's a big, big promise. Not all of us have been given that promise. Not all of us have been given that promise. Don't, I try to be careful. I told our church, we used to sing a little chorus around here called, Every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line. I can't remember the rest of the words now, but... I could sing one or two phrases. But I started to learn as I studied God's word, every promise in this book isn't mine. That promise that was made to Simeon wasn't made to me. Now, God, there's a lot of wonderful promises here for us. There's some promises made to Old Testament Israel that are not made to us in this New Testament church age. I want to say publicly for a moment, God's not done with Israel. 
He will continue to use and work through his people and redeem them. I believe that. There's a lot of foolishness going around in the theological world about that. It's wrong, according to God's word. Listen, I want to say this, that God, they would be led, and he had a specific promise. I know that God didn't make this promise to me, but he has made some promises. Maybe you sense in your relationship with the Lord and your prayer and Bible study, your serving God, your relationship with him, that God is, you know what you say, I don't know if God's promised me something. If you're as right with God as you know how to be, what is a great desire that God's put in your heart? Maybe it's a prayer for a loved one to get saved. Maybe it's, maybe it's a desire for, for God to do something. I want you to understand, that's what we're talking about here. His desires and God's will matched up perfectly here. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Sometimes we make it so hard to figure out what God wants to do. God is not trying to get you to do something you don't want to do. If we will be right with him and follow him and commit ourselves unto him, it says there in Psalm 37, our desires and his desires will line up. I want you to know, if yours right, you know how to be, and God's put a desire in your heart, I count it as a promise. I count that as a promise. And you ought to keep that promise and know that God's going to keep his promise to you. He may not give you this specific promise, but believe his promises. He heard God speak. He knew he would live to see the Messiah. And when Jesus came in, he knew it. He submitted, by the way, it says, to the Spirit of God. He came to the temple. He's a man that worshiped. But on this day, he said, God told him to go to the temple, and he went there. And here we get into verse 28 quickly. Then he took Jesus up in his arms here. The, the mom and dad had come in, Joseph and Mary had come in. And all of a sudden, this older gentleman maybe steps across the, the way there. He sees Jesus come into this ceremony, and he looks here, and he says, My, 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 this is the one I've been waiting for. God is making good on his promise. This is the day that I see Jesus. And he was so excited, the Bible says he took the child and held him up in his arms. Held him up in his arms. And I'm sure Joseph and Mary were like, "What? Hold up, my friend. What's going on here? Who are you? Where'd you come from? Why are you touching my baby? I don't, that's another sanctified imagination, but that's, ladies, you know what I'm talking about. Amen. Here's G, one commentator said, here's Jesus resting in the arms of Simeon. At the same time, Jesus is resting in Jesus' salvation. He goes on to deliver this poetic blessing here in verse 29. Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. He says there in verse 34, Mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. This perspective that he has is so unusual. He's a man of God, and he says, I'm ready to go home now. I've seen it all. It's a pivotal moment in his life and, and in this gospel account here. No doubt in human history, he's witnessing something. I say again, not a political movement, not some overthrow of the Roman government. He, he does not, he's not looking for some Jewish religious even experience. He's looking for the Messiah and the fulfillment of the expectation that he had longed for. And it's all wrapped up in this baby that he's holding now in his arms. And I ask you, what do you have? What do you have in your heart that you're waiting for? What is it you're looking for? What is it you're longing for i want you to know you'll find it in the person of jesus christ you'll find it in the person of jesus christ he says I, i'm so happy i'm ready to go i'm ready to be released he's he's speaking almost like a prisoner who's, who he says i want to be released uh, he's like a slave who's been who's looked at the horizon to see his long-awaited freedom and he reports to his master that he's ready to go and he seeks the privilege of going off duty he looks at Jesus and speaks of him as a light to lighten the Gentiles. And Jesus is the light that lightens this dark world and the glory for God's people Israel. This is the Lord Jesus Christ as he delivers this beautiful poetic and prophetic best blessing. And then here in verse 34, 35, he, gives this, he continues to speak to Mary. And in this beautiful time of a newborn child, maybe 40 days old, and the happiness and joy that's related to new birth and new parents and the excitement and all the things that are going on, Simeon, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, reminds them as he blesses them and talks to Mary, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel. This baby will cause the rising and falling of many. It was an expression used in the early church in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 6. It says, Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, and the, the same is made the head of the corner. 
and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. When Jesus is preached, my friend, as with God willing, we will preach in this church until, until the last breath in my body. When Jesus is preached, he always produces a rising or a falling. You cannot stay neutral. You must accept him for who he is or reject him. Jesus is history's dividing ridge. The whole world is affected in one way or another by the Jesus, the Son of God here, the Son of Mary. No one can hear the gospel and not fall or rise under the hearing of it. I ask you, will you accept Christ this day? Here as a baby, 40 days old, the shadow of the cross is falling across this precious little one. This sword, by the way, that he speaks of is not some small instrument, but a large, wide sword signifying extreme anguish. And when Jesus died on the cross for us, the physical torture was unimaginable. The beard plucked, the thorns on the brow, the, the spikes driven into the hands and to the feet, the spear thrust into the side. But I say to you again, the emotional tolls, he screamed out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then the toll of becoming your sin and feeling the guilt and shame of my sin and your sin and the sin of all people for all time, that was the sword that would pierce through his soul and through the soul of his mother. By the way, John chapter 19 and verse 25, when Jesus hung on that cross, Mary was found right there at the foot of the cross. How could that precious mother stand and watch her son be so mistreated because she knew he was fulfilling the mission what the angel had told her years ago was coming to pass. Mine eyes have seen thy salvation. You know, through our, our vantage point, it's, it's, it's a bit different. It's a bit different than Simeon's. We look back and see Jesus certainly as the Old Testament is fulfilling those Old Testament prophecies. And the Lord is certainly, we understand this New Age, uh, New Age, New Testament uh, age, excuse me, is the Messiah who's come to redeem us. He's come to comfort us. Come to save us. We ought to rejoice like, Amy, like Simeon does. We ought to rejoice. We ought to just lose ourselves in the fact that God has kept his promise, but not just at Christmas, but all through the year. Like Simeon, we ought to long for the day when Jesus will come again. And my friend, we ought to be looking for Christ. If we're right with God, we'll be looking for Christ. If we're not right with God, we'll be hoping that doesn't happen today. But what are you waiting for? Christ has come. He's coming again. And whatever it is that you think you may be looking for in this life, Christ is that answer. He's the fulfillment of it. Charles Eliot was the president, and then he retired and became the president of emeritus of Harvard University. And the story goes, during the summer of his 90th year, he made his way slowly down the road from his cottage in northeast Harbor, Maine, to the cottage of his neighbors. They were called the Peabody's. Miss Peabody greeted him at the door warmly, gave him a little hug and welcomed him in to the living room. And after a warm conversation, a brief conversation, Mr. Elliot asked if he might hold their brand new baby. She was a bit mystified by that, not so sure about it. Uh, but Mrs. Peabody brought the baby in, lifted her infant son from the crib, took him and laid him in the arms of Harvard's venerable president emeritus, 90 years young. Elliot held the baby quietly for a few minutes. And then with the gesture of thanks, he returned the baby to his mother and he said this. He said, I've been looking at the end of life for so long that I wanted to look at for a few minutes at the beginning of it. Just want to look at it for a, for a little while. I think maybe while he's expressing us, uh, some, some idea of needing hope. Hope. That little baby brought him some hope. You know, in all points of life, whether it be young or old, we need hope. And one of the blessings that, that comes along with little children is the idea of hope, hope for what their life could be, hope for what they will do. You know, as we bring children in this world, we realize we have a lot of hope, but there's a lot of uncertainty, even from disease and death. You know, if we make it past those things in life, then we worry about people who mistreat children. There's so much to be concerned and worried about. But because of hope, we don't let that stop us from bringing children into this world and raising them with uncertainties in life, we need hope. Simeon was a man who could have been pessimistic. He could have been a grumpy old man. He'd been waiting a long time. He hadn't gotten maybe what he wanted. That's how we might look at it. But he had hope. He was just. He was devout. He was waiting. He had the Holy Ghost upon him. And he wasn't filled with anxiety and fear. He was brimming over with hope. And when he held the infant Jesus in his arm in that temple area there, he knew th this was much more than an old man picking up a little baby. This was a believer in God. 
who was seeing God make good on his promise. He put his hope in the promises of God. And my friend today, I ask you to put your hope in the promises of God. Let's bow our head for a word of prayer, please. Thank you for your attention. So much to say, maybe too much to say. But God, by his spirit, speaks to your heart. I speak emphatically, I, but don't let my passion drive you away or pull you in. Listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. This man understood what God was doing. And I wonder today how many in this room have any clue what God is doing. I'll tell you, I, sometimes I'm at a loss. But I want to know. I want to follow the Lord. I want to be obedient to him. That begins by coming to him in faith, trusting him as your personal savior today. If you have not had a time in your life where you sincerely and completely put your trust in Jesus Christ for your soul's salvation, you could do that today while heads are bowed and eyes are closed. You could pray a simple prayer. I'd encourage you to join me in this prayer. It's not a perfect prayer, but it's something that you would say like this with the true sincerity in your heart. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Give me the hope of your salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. A simple prayer like that, prayed sincerely, will be answered by God with a yes. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you've prayed that prayer in just a moment, I want to ask you to make your way forward as we step Stand together, excuse me. We'll stand together and I ask you to step out and someone will meet you and greet you and try to encourage you and help you with your walk in Christ. Christians, let's keep believing God, amen? amen. You might be like me and stand out there at the graveyard and wonder why God's not doing what you want him to do right now. Well, God's going to do what he's going to do the right way and at the right time. And just because he's not doing it now doesn't mean I don't have to trust him. Amen? This altar is open this morning if you want to come forward and ask God to help you with that. Let's stand together, please. We have a hymn of invitation, 490. Take my life and let it be. And as they begin to play, we'll sing in just a moment. There's your opportunity to respond to what's been preached today. We preach for responses for you to respond to God, not to me. If you know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, you may need to be baptized. You're welcome to come forward and we can help you with that. You may have an interest in being a part of this church. You certainly could come forward and we'd be glad to help you with that. But if you don't know Jesus, come and let us help you today. Ready? Take my life and let it be still at work he's not done yet father thank you for the truth of your word may it encourage our hearts uh, to give ourselves you completely, to yield to your way completely. Lord, help us to do what we ought to do so that you can use our lives. And I pray you'd help us, Lord, many, maybe today, maybe making a first step. I pray you just go with them and help our church be a blessing, encouragement to them. Lord, as we end this year and start the next, thank you for your faithfulness. And I pray that we would hang in there with your help, looking up and believing in what you're doing in this world and in our lives. I pray it in Jesus' name. 
Amen and amen. God bless you. Travis, I want you to come here. Uh, you can stand right up here, Brother John, if you don't mind to stand with him. That'll be great. Travis came by our church last week after church was out. Yeah. He didn't even come to listen to the preacher. How about that? <laughs> but he came by church. He pulled into the parking lot. He, and Brother Caleb met him. He just said, I felt like God wanted me to come into this place. I, I want to know more about this church. And so Brother Caleb brought him back to my office, and the three of us stood there and talked. And, and so we just got to the point, asked him about his relationship with God. And he has a, a wonderful church background. I believe he wants to honor the Lord. But he, he bowed his head and prayed and asked Jesus into his heart. And we're glad for that. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So we want to bless and encourage him. I'm going to ask him in just a few moments to be at the back door. I want you to shake his hand and encourage him. 19, 19, 19 years old. How about that? That was a couple of years ago for me. But his, his life is ahead of him to serve God. And now we have an opportunity. I have him up here not for his sake, but I have him up here for your sake, church, my, our sake. Now we have a responsibility to help this young man. Uh, now we have, we have something else to add to our to-do list. All right, and I'll, I'll help lead all that. But this is not about him, you seeing him today. It's about you seeing your job, our role, and bringing along a new believer. Amen? Amen? That's what God's called us to do, and I'm glad that we can have a part in it. God bless you, gentlemen. I'll let you be step down there, and in just a moment, we'll be, meet you at the back door. I want you to be back in church tonight. I want you to pray again for Jennifer Olson today. God bless her and her family in church today. Greet them. I know they need to get out of here, and they had the funeral service for her mother is at 3 o'clock today. If you need want to go over and you still need help with directions, you can see myself or Brother Caleb here at the end. We'd be glad to help you with that. Thank you for being in church today, especially if you're visiting. I look forward to meeting you at the door in just a moment. Brother Caleb, if you'll lead us in prayer, I'd appreciate it. Dear Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us and thank you for speaking to our hearts this morning. I pray that you would help us to take this message to heart. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to seek after thee. And Lord, I thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for the gift of salvation. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to take that job seriously of, of giving the gospel to others. Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes to see people that you bring across our path. And I pray that you